everyone. Welcome to episode 178 of the Book Cougars, Two Middle-Aged Women on the Hunt for a Good Read. I'm Emily. And I'm Cress. We have some thank yous. We have giveaway winners to announce. Let's get busy. Yes, we are so happy that Karen was our patron winner of Bright and Deadly Things. And then Tara, or Tara, we're sorry, we're not sure about the correct pronunciation, was our newsletter winner of Speak for the Dead. And ironically, she lives in Canada. So she was thrilled to receive a copy of this book by Amy Tektor, a Canadian writer. So exciting. I love it when it works out that way. Synchronicity. Yes. So in giveaway news. Well, upcoming giveaway news. Yes. Upcoming. We just told you who won the last giveaways in upcoming giveaway news. We have for our patrons, if you are a patron by April 15th, you will be automatically entered to win The Hidden Life of Aster Kelly by Catherine A. Sherbrooke. She's the author of Leaving Coy's Hill, which was one of Chris's top 10 books. I love that book so much. It's one that I still think about. It was about the suffragette Lucy Stone. This is a novel. And just the quick blurb at the top says, when a runway model in 1940s Hollywood makes a split second decision intended to protect those that she loves, she triggers a cascade of secrets that threatens to upend her daughter's life decades later. And although a novel, it is based on something that really did happen in Catherine Sherbrooke's life. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Well, the Lucy Stone, that was a novel as well. I mean, it was such a great story. She's a wonderful storyteller, talking about real things that happened. So I, I look forward to that one. Yes. And we just got thank you, I should say, to Pegasus Books for sending us this beautiful finished copy. Yep. So again, that'll be April 15th drawing for Patreon members. Yes. So if you aren't a patron and would like to become one, check out our Patreon page. And then our upcoming read along for second quarter is The Reading List by Sarah Nisha Adams. Thank you to William Morrow for sending us a copy to host a giveaway with our newsletter subscribers. Yes. And this one, we are going to pick the winner on March 29th, the day after this episode drops. So if you're a newsletter subscriber, you're automatically entered to win. And if you're not, you have a few hours to become one. Just go to <laughs> bookcookers.com and, you, and you'll see the subscribe button there. And if you miss this, if you're listening to this in April or something, go ahead and subscribe because we do giveaways frequently. And if you are a newsletter subscriber, you're automatically entered to win those. And you get our lovely newsletter once a month. Once a month. Yeah. So the read along, the Zoom discussion for that will be on Sunday, May 21st at 7 p.m. Eastern time. We've had some folks signing up already. If you'd like to participate in that Zoom call, please send us an email and let us know and we'll save a spot for you. We've gotten a lot of interest each time. They seem to increase more. So do email if you're interested to get your name on the list because we're probably gonna have to start cutting it off, unfortunately. I know we feel really sad about that, but it's also if it gets too big, then it's hard to have a conversation. Right, So yeah. But yeah, please join us. We also have discussion thread on goodreads.com if you'd like to check that out and talk about the book there, or you can always send us your comments on email. And all of this information is in the show notes for this episode at bookcougars.com. And then we also want to let you know that we have some new patrons. Yes, we really thank you all for your generosity. Jan increased her monthly membership recently. And Tara or Tara is a new patron. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. It really helps. Yes. And then Rain sent us a lovely direct donation in the form of a check. Thank you so much for your generosity. And reminder that you can learn more about how to help support the Book Cougars podcast by going to our website, either through the show notes or there's on the subscribe page, there's information about how to donate, or you can always just email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. Chris, what are you currently reading? I'm currently reading Chase of the Wild Goose by Mary Gordon. And this is a novel that first came out from Hogarth Press in 1936. That's Virginia Woolf's Press. And it was recently put out in a new edition by Lurid Editions just last month, so 2023. And this is a story of the ladies of Langolin. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. They were two upper-class Irish women 
who did not want to marry, who fell in love with one another and left Ireland and established a home together in Wales. It's a novel, but based on a true story. I'm reading it in part for the Wales readathon, the doathon that happens every March. Being in school, it's hard to to read as much as I want to for pleasure. But when I saw the new edition out of this, I thought I had to get it. So I did order it from the UK. And they have these fuchsia covers, uh, Lurid Press. So they really stand out. And I just started it and I'm really enjoying it. Really well written. I mean, you know, it was selected for publication by Virginia Woolf. So she kind of knew a thing or two about good writing, as they say. Right. (laughs) Um, So I look forward to diving into this more in the coming days. And I should note that it's blurbed by Sarah Waters, which is always an attraction for me because, you know, she doesn't tend to blurb a whole lot. So when I do see her name on the cover of a, a book with a blurb, I tend to pay attention And she calls this a fascinating piece of queer literary history. And I should say that, so for my class, The History of the Book, we had to attend a online book fair, an antiquarian book fair. And they have these that you can sign up for. They usually last over the weekend or a few days. And there was a second edition from, I guess it was 1936, but it was the second edition for sale of this book. And it was a hundred dollars. And I really looked at it. I clicked it as a favorite to come back to. And by the time I logged on again to check it out, it was gone. Somebody had purchased it, but that was probably the best for my bank account. (laughs) Um, But that was kind of neat to come across. So Chase of the Wild Goose by Mary Gordon. Very cool. I'm reading Life B, Overcoming Double Depression by Beth Ann Patrick. Some of you might be familiar with her. She goes by the handle, the book maven on Twitter, and she started the hashtag Friday reads. Yes. All hail. Yes. Yes. I mean, look at that, how much she's impacted the book world, not only from her writing and her reviews, but just from a simple hashtag that has brought so many people together. Yeah. And I mean, she is revered as a reviewer and someone who moderates authors interviews and things like that. So when I found out that she had a memoir coming out, I got my little hands on it early. This publishes on May 16th. And it's about her life as someone who has come to terms with her mental illness. And she's been diagnosed much later in life with having double depression, which is a mental illness wherein chronic depression spirals into major depressive episodes during times of stress. And I just thought I'd read this one little paragraph that's kind of like the thesis of the book. My story is about making a decision about my well-being, about hearing through another human being that it was my choice, not someone else's, only mine. It sounds so simple, and sometimes for some people, it is. For me, it wasn't. I had to break through many sets of expectations in order to understand that only I had the power to save my own life and only I had the power to change it. And so that's just in the introduction to the book. And she's a great writer, really good writer. I'm enjoying it. It's tough. You know, she talks a lot about her family of origin, growing up with a grandmother upstairs that was mentally ill and nobody really talked about it talking about mental illness, passing down through the generations of a family and rising above, but also in a way that you recognize, you know, you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. Getting a diagnosis isn't the only answer. You still have to come to terms with living with your diagnosis. So I think I'm about 40%, 50% really enjoying it. It's kind of my nighttime e-reader read read that we talk about when I can't sleep and I don't want to have to turn on lights and all of that. Again, that's called Life B, Overcoming Double Depression by Beth Ann Patrick out mid-May. Nice. That's definitely going on my TBR. I definitely want to read that. Well, we have a theme. The next book I'm listening to is an audio book that I am listening to, and it is called Why Am I So Anxious? Powerful Tools for Recognizing Anxiety and Restoring Your Peace by Dr. Tracy Marks. And so... Tracy Marks is somebody I came across on YouTube. She's a psychiatrist who does mental health videos. I found her one day when I was Googling around about ADHD stuff 
I landed on one of her videos and watched it and really liked her because she's really straightforward. There's no bells and whistles and she's friendly, but not like overly trying to be your buddy kind of situation. So I really like her directness a lot. And I was watching some of her videos the other day, and one of them mentioned that she had a book. And I had no idea she had a book. This one, it just came out recently, and she reads the audiobook. I mean, I like it because I like her voice a lot, um, but there seems to be a lot of lists that she's reading, and that can be hard for an audiobook because... In some cases, she's talking about listing medication and what a common dosage is. And she's a psychiatrist, but she talks about all different types of treatments that are available for anxiety, alternative medicines, hypnotism, and just all the different types of therapies that are out there that don't involve medication, like aromatherapy. She's a big believer in aromatherapy. So I'm really enjoying it. I recommend if you want to check her out, check out some of her YouTube videos. If this book sounds like something up your alley, I'll report more on it later after I finish it. Again, that's Why Am I So Anxious? Powerful Tools for Recognizing Anxiety and Restoring Your Peace by Tracy Marks. And I had also realized, like, I haven't listened to or read a self help book yet this year. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm kind of due for that because I've often liked to start the year off with something like that. But I at least like to try and read like one a quarter just to keep myself tuned up, so to say, and learn some new things as well. Yeah. Did she by any chance mention, because I just was hearing about this this morning about counting backwards, that that can stop an anxiety spin that you're having. I use counting backwards in the middle of the night to try to fall back to sleep. Oh, interesting. But I've never thought of it as a way to stop if you're ruminating or having a lot of anxiety. She hasn't yet that I've caught anyway i'm just on the chapter now where she's talking about like cognitive behavioral therapy and other talk therapies for Mm -hmm. for anxiety so maybe it'll it'll get there yeah i'm curious i'm reading cook as you are which i thought i had mentioned already on the podcast but in a previous episode but i don't think i have and this is another it's like not a huge cookbook but it's really heavy because it's got this thick, nice paper. And it's by Ruby Tando. The subtitle is Recipes for Real Life, Hungry Cooks and Messy Kitchens. (laughs) And Ruby Tando was a finalist in the Great British Bake Off in 2013. And she has another book called Eat Up and one that's called Flavor. And the flavor is spelled in the British way, O-U-R, which I love. And one of the really interesting things about this book is there's no pictures of the final recipe. I had a really interesting conversation with another friend that likes to cook about that. Are you someone that likes the final picture next to a recipe? Because then you can say like, this is kind of what it's supposed to look like. Or does it just depress you because yours never looks like that? Or another friend of mine said, I prefer a picture of a step in a recipe. Mm. At this point, yes, it might look curdled, but it's supposed to. And this is what it's going to look like. And Ruby Tando feels really strongly like, no pictures of steps, no pictures of final recipes that interferes with your trust of yourself and your own cooking. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's really kind of insightful, isn't it? Yeah. So I really appreciate that, but it's still filled with beautiful, cool images in other ways, just to kind of make the book look happy and spirited. And maybe that is relative to something she's talking about, but not to the recipes themselves. So it's a fun book in that way. I'm not very deep into it, but um, her writing is is sweet. So I think I will read it more than even maybe cooking from it. Yeah. You know? And again, that's called Cook As You Are by Ruby Tando. Well, my current e-reader book that I'm reading at bedtime is the third Outlander novel. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I could tell just by the little, little sly look on your face. Yeah. So this one is Voyager. It's only 870 pages. Um, But I couldn't sleep the other night. Well, no, what happened was I was in bed. I I finished the book I was reading. And then I thought, oh, I'm not ready to sleep yet. So then I read a Willa Cather short story. That's this month's story for the Willa Cather short story project, which is called Jack a Boy. I read that and I was like, oh, I'm still not ready to sleep. And I just missed Claire and Jamie 
<laughs> in the Scottish Highlands. So that's what I downloaded and started reading. I was going to wait until the summer, but um, it just happened. So it's uh, called Voyager. And that is the third book that I'm currently reading. Right on. Only a million more pages to go. Good for you. (laughs) Well, Emily, what have you just read? I finished reading The Memory of Animals by Claire Fuller. This book is out from Tin House on June 6th. Thank you to both NetGalley and Tin House for the early copy. This is about Nephi, who's a marine biologist. She has lost her job working at an aquarium and has kind of lost her way. She's dating somebody and she gets the opportunity to participate in a trial for an immunization for a disease that's just starting to plague people in London. Mm. So she checks herself in. Her family is not excited about her signing up to be in this drug trial and starts to get the inoculations intravenously through her arm. And then this pandemic goes wild. She kind of gets locked in because they're not sure if she's going to end up being contagious or what have you, because she does have the illness To make a long story short, because you got to read the book to find out all the details, she becomes immune to the illness, but she's in now in quarantine in this building with the other people who have survived. And that's where the story really takes off. One of the gentlemen there has a contraption. It goes on your head and with your brain waves or some sort of engineering feat, you can go back and revisit your memories from the past wow. and you can kind of get addicted to it, which is problematic. Oh, I would think so. Right. It's yeah. like that mirror in the Harry Potter series, right? The, right. the mirror where you see what you most deeply desire. And as Dumbledore says to Harry, the most contented person in the world will look into that mirror and just see themselves. Mm. Whereas everybody else like Ron is seeing himself as like head boy and a, Quidditch star and Harry seeing himself with his parents that he never knew. Right. So this is similar in the sense that I think when you can go back and revisit your past, you see it in either an idyllic way or you want to change things or it's just like, who doesn't want to go and spend time in a part of your life that was beautiful as opposed to, you know, in a pandemic (laughs) trying to figure out what the future holds, you know? And so what, Claire Fuller's doing here is really looking at captivity. Mm -hmm. So there's also this mirror of these animals. She's also writing letters to somebody, the main character, Nephi, and you don't know who this person is because the letters are written to Dear H. And I'm not going to spoil who that is for you, but it's about other beings that are being held captive or were being held captive and how you handle that as a living creature. And for some people, it goes well, and for some, it doesn't. Mm. And then also the idea of grief, because here she is, and she doesn't know what's happening in the outside world and with people that she loved that have to face the pandemic, not you know locked up in this hospital wing. So it's a very interesting book. Claire Fuller is a great writer. There was a little bit in the middle where I kind of felt like, I lost my way with it a little bit, but then when it's revealed who she's writing the letters to, it takes back off. For me, it did anyway. I really enjoyed it. Very different story. Very different. She's an interesting writer. (laughs) Again, it's called The Memory of Animals by Claire Fuller out in June. Well, no surprise, I finished Dragonfly in Amber, which was the second Outlander novel by Diana Gabaldon. This one was 947 pages. I looked it up because it's like, oh, okay, no wonder it took a bit of time to get through since I'm only reading it at bedtime usually. I enjoyed it, obviously. When people have asked me what I'm reading and I say that, they'll say, oh, how is that? I've wanted to read that. Or they'll say, oh, my God, I love that. Or they don't say anything. (laughs) (laughs) But as I've said to people who are interested in reading, I'll say it can be really bad and it's really good. It does have a little bit of everything in it. I enjoyed it enough, obviously, to pick up the third one. So that's where I am with the Outlander series. I have to ask you, you know, when I'm reading my Kindle, I usually set it to time left in book and it's a percentage. 
Do you like to do that with your Kindle? Because I would think with reading these size books, it would be like it never moves. It takes forever to move. Oh, I have it set on how much I've read. Okay. So the first night that I picked it up, I read 2%. Mm -hmm. And then as of this morning, I was at 7%. Okay. So So making progress. Yeah. Yeah. It's just interesting because it seems like with a thousand page book, it would take a while to see progress. Yeah. That's not what reading is about. Well, it's really interesting because with the Outlander ones from 2 to 7% is big. Yeah, I know that now, you know, as opposed to (laughs) the other book I read, which was a biography that was not as long by any means I was just like wow I'm whipping through this thing like you know nobody's business (laughs) (laughs) I finished a book called Our Best Intentions and this one got on my radar from a publicist that sent us information about it it just came out in the last week and it's by Vibhuti Jain and she grew up in Guilford, which really? is part of what got my attention. Oh, yeah. Cool. Guilford, Connecticut, which Guilford, is where Connecticut. we live. Yeah. Yep. And she graduated from Yale and Harvard. She goes by Vib. This is Vib's debut novel. And I always get my curiosity peaked if it's written by a lawyer. She now lives in South Africa in Johannesburg with her husband and daughter, I believe. It's about a young Indian American woman that goes by the name Angie and her father. And they're living in a very affluent suburb of New York City that, as I was reading the book, sounded very much like Guilford, Connecticut. (laughs) (laughs) And her father is running a company, kind of like an Uber-esque type of company. He's doing his best. He wants his daughter to be successful, and he's doing everything he can to make that happen. And his daughter is an avid swimmer. And one day it's the middle of summer and she's walking across the football field at school, having come from a swim and comes across two of the golden boys in the high school. And one has been stabbed and the other one is chasing after somebody that she can't see. And so Angie calls 911 and then gets completely pulled into this situation that she had nothing to do with. She was an innocent bystander. There's another young woman who was attending the school who had come from Philadelphia to live with her cousin and is black. What the author does with this novel is to look at race relations and class in a very wealthy town in a high school setting where something terrible happens and a lot of assumptions are made Hmm. about what happened and the cause of it. And then a father who's just trying so hard for her daughter to succeed. And this daughter is now caught up in something that she had nothing to do with. Yeah. Wow. It was very poignant, well-written, I definitely would say it's a debut novel. There were points where I was like, okay, let's keep going with the story, (laughs) you know, but I really enjoyed it. It surprised me for a novel that was over 300 pages. I felt like the ending came a little too quickly. Not that I wasn't ready to find out like what did really happen here, but she tied it up a little too quickly at the end, Mm. but I did enjoy it. And I really enjoyed the references to Guilford that I could see. I mean, she, at one point, the characters go to Ham and Asset (laughs) And she works at Willoughby's Coffee, which is like our local coffee store around here, you know. Yeah. So that so part cool. was fun. Yeah. yeah. Ham and Asset, that's a, a state park here in Connecticut. That it's a it's a big beach. It's I think the largest beach in Connecticut, isn't it? Probably for walking on. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, yeah for beautiful. sure. So it's out now. She's on book tour. And again, it's called Our Best Intentions by Vibhuti Jane. Very cool. When you were saying she's walking across the football field, I did not expect that she would come upon somebody who'd just been stabbed. That was a yeah, surprise. I didn't either. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, I did read The Warden by Anthony Trollope, and I really enjoyed it and had a great conversation with Robin, Karen, and Thomas last weekend. We got together on Zoom and had a really good talk about it. It was the first Trollope for Robin, the second for Karen. And Thomas, I thought he read them all, but he hasn't, but he's read a bunch of Trollope. So it was nice to have his perspective with a little bit more info. But this novel, The Warden, it's his only short one. I think I can confidently say that. He was a Victorian writer. This book came out smack dab in the middle of the 19th century when big books were a thing and the multi-volume novel was a thing. It would come out 
in three parts. So one of the you know, theories is you could loan it. You know, you didn't have to wait for somebody to finish reading a 900 page novel. They could read 300 pages and pass it on, you know, oh, that's cool. And it reminds me of Parnassus on wheels, like instead of funereal right. orations, <laughs> you could be passing along a little trollop, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then it helped libraries too with circulation, I guess. The warden is a man who's in this position, kind of overseeing a hospital where there are 12 men who live there on charity, I guess. So what happened was a landowner from hundreds of years ago had left this land and money to take care of men who could no longer work or who were retired and had nobody to care for them. Again, remember, this is the 19th century when they didn't have the social financial networks that we have today necessarily. So there's a lot of church reform going on at this time too. And this hospital is connected to the church. The warden doesn't really know anything about the finances. He doesn't really, he's just a nice, kind, generous man who's happy that he has a lovely home and a wonderful daughter living with him. His other daughter is married. And the church reformers come after the situation that he's getting 800 pounds a year for basically doing, quote, nothing. And the men who are the patients or the men living at this house start agitating that they should be getting more money because these lawyers are whipping people up and their church reform going on for good reason. But as the narrator says, just because something is old and it's been around for a while doesn't mean it's abusive and needs to be changed. And at the same time, some things do need to be changed. So there's a lot of tension between the old and the new reform and conservative church. And I enjoyed it so much. There was one point where I thought, you know, if I wasn't reading this as a buddy read, I might not continue on. But I'm glad I did. Because it made it just gave me such a good feeling for the warden. And you know what it does, it's it's a book that looks at somebody who's in a situation that they thought was completely beneficial to everyone around them. And when it's pointed out to him, that perhaps things are problematic, he takes action, mm. you know? Yeah. It made me think of that saying, you know, when you know better, you can do better. Mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily a spoiler, but Dickens shows up in here a lot. It's kind of like being not made fun of, but parodied a little bit. And that his novels of social reform are sometimes more impactful than the actual poor people or the people who've been harmed or who are in a harmful situation, his novels are more impactful than the actual people. Mm -hmm. And he's not called Dickens in here. There, there's another name for the writer. And um, The Alms House, I believe, is the title of the novel that's given, and that's supposed to be Bleak House. That's funny. Yeah, so that was kind of cool. So, yeah, it's a story about change that's handled with grace by at least one of the characters, church versus the poor and the illiterate. Which is another thing, too. I think we, for the most part, take literacy for granted, at least in this country. I know illiteracy rates are rising, but there are scenes in this book where the lawyers are trying to get the patients, the 12 men who are living at this hospital, to sign a statement saying that, yes, we want this lawsuit to proceed. And most of the men have given their mark put you know, their X on the paper because they are literate. And this one man who's been going on about reading and how he can read and all this stuff, it becomes really obvious that he can't and that he can't write. And one of the other characters does such a wonderful job is just so compassionate and saying to him, you know, I know that you probably just don't want to show off when all the other men have made their mark. You probably don't want to look like you're being uppity by writing your signature. So if you want to just make your X, your mark, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a lovely way to handle it and let the guy save face. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I really enjoyed it for also the commentary that he was making on the power of the press, because there's also a very powerful newspaper that's shaping public opinion that the editor doesn't possibly know what he's talking about in writing things on hearsay. So there's the popular newspaper, there's the popular novel, and Wrecking Havoc, 
causing positive change, you'll have to read it and decide yourself. So again, that was The Warden by Anthony Trollope, my classic for this quarter. Congratulations on your first Trollope. <laughs> it might, yes, uh, I know I won't be jumping into any more Trollope anytime soon. I actually do think I'd rather read like a big George Eliot or another Dickens. Hmm. Okay, good to know. Mm-hmm. The other book I read was I Have Some Questions for You by Rebecca Mackay, which I, for the most part, listened to on Libro.fm. And it's narrated by Julia Whelan, who I know is one of the outstanding award-winning narrators around. And then there's a little tiny, very small part that's narrated by J.D. Jackson. This book is very similar to Our Best Intentions, which I didn't know when I decided to pick up Our Best Intentions and then listen to I Have Some Questions for You. And I feel like it did Our Best Intentions a little disservice because that's a debut novelist, whereas Rebecca Mackay is, you know, like Pulitzer Prize winning novelist. So the writing was a little bit different. (laughs) But the stories had a similar tone in that I have some questions for you is about Bodie Kane. It's narrated from her perspective. She's a successful podcaster, which I thought was pretty cool. And she's gone back to Granby High School, which was her boarding school, high school, where she went to school. And she's going back to teach students how to podcast. When she was there, I think it was her junior year, her roommate, Thalia, was murdered. The person who was accused of her murder was Omar, who was the athletic director on their campus. There was always some suspicion. Was that really who did it or was that the neat and tidy, quick sort of thing where the police looked at one obvious person and didn't look for anything else? Mm -hmm. So Bodhi is telling the story to somebody, which is quite confusing at the very beginning. You don't know who it is. And then there is a reveal at some point. And you're like, oh, I get who she's telling the story to. The person who she thinks did it. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to tell you who she thought who it was. I wouldn't dare. One of the things that was very weird for me is the person killed in this book is Thalia. And then in Our Best Intention, there's a character named Thalia. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that is not a common name. That is very interesting. So I just thought I'd tell you that. I was like, ooh, not only am I reading books that have a similar kind of theme about a student I have some questions for you. The student is murdered in our best intentions. There's a stabbing and an injury. Hmm. So what Rebecca Mackay does with this book is she really gets the current students of Granby interested in this old case and they start to dig up some dirt and shake things up so that there's an investigation that starts to take place Hmm. or I shouldn't say an investigation. Well, some investigating, but a new trial potentially It was very reminiscent of Serial, if any of you were fans of that podcast, Serial, where they took on this first season, they took on the case of Adnan Saeed, who was accused of murdering his girlfriend in high school. Similar in that this young man, Omar, now has been in prison for 25 plus years. And now there's people saying, you know, did he do it? Was there ever really a true investigation? And then you have all of these people who were kids in high school and now are very much launched in their lives, you know, in their forties and someone's coming up and saying, I have some questions about, you know, where were you the night of Thalia's murder? And do you remember what happened? It's intriguing. The other thing she does is there are regular chapters and parts of the book, but then there are things where she'll say, number one, and it's headed by someone's name. And that's someone that she's considering like, as a potential suspect. And that was a little confusing with the audio. So at one point I just went to the library and picked up the hard copy. I did have an ebook copy, but that was a little confusing too. And I wanted to see like, how does this actually look in the book? Mm -hmm. So I did that. And once I looked at that, it totally made sense to me. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very well written. I really enjoyed this book. And Julia Whelan is a great narrator. And then there's a very, very small portion narrated by this character, Omar, who is the young man, now adult man, who has been in prison, convicted of this murder for years. They made it as a podcaster, you know, we're podcasters. It was kind of fun because when they went to introduce this part of the book, they said, you know, we were speaking to him over telephone from the prison. So the quality's not great, you know, (laughs) 
<laughs> and they kind of made it that, you know, with the, with the narration. So I appreciated that. Um, so good book. I really enjoyed it. I recommend it. I have some questions for you, Rebecca Mackay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I read a new biography on Poe, um, A Mystery of Mysteries, The Death and Life of Edgar Allan Poe by Mark Dawidziak, I think is how you pronounce his name. It just came out. It's one that our mystery man, John Valeri, mentioned as being on his TBR. And I really enjoyed it. It's a biography that's very chatty. Hmm. You know, it's not like a heavy academic thing. It's written for a more popular audience. And he interviews a lot of scholars of Poe and novelists of Poe and people who've researched Poe. And he quotes them a lot, but in a way that, like I said, it makes it seem very chatty. So it was an easy read, and I enjoyed it very much. I don't know much about Poe, so this gave me some more context for his life. But the focus is very much on his death, because Poe's death is a mystery. No one really knows why he died. He was found raving and wearing other people's clothes, and he had brain fever. He wasn't making sense, and then he died days later. So it's been a mystery. Why did he die? What killed him? Mark looks at all of the different theories. He starts with alternating chapters. So it's like close to Poe's death, you know, the last couple days. And then he goes to his early life. And then a few more days closer to his death. And then like his young adult. So these alternating chapters, you end up then at his death. And the attending physician at the hospital where Poe spent his last few days, gave wildly different stories over the decades of what actually happened during those days and what Poe said and what he said. So the guy was an amateur writer who was trying to make a name for himself, apparently. Mm. Like the one person who, quote, should be the most reliable, the doctor, was just all over the place. So Mark has a couple theories. Like he looks at some of the major theories of why Poe died. There's some really wild ones out there. There's some that can be discounted, like that he had rabies. And I remember when that theory first came up that, you know, this was the new theory, but apparently there are new theories every decade or so <laughs> that come up about what killed Poe. And it uh, can't be rabies because there's documentation that he swallowed beverage, water, the last few days of his life. And apparently if you have rabies, you can't swallow. So that rules that out, which is kind of nice that you can do that. There are hair samples from Poe that can tell some information, but nothing has been revealed that could show that this is what killed him. In the end, they think it was probably tuberculosis meningitis because everyone in his family, including his wife, died of tuberculosis that's an overstatement, but a lot of people around him and during the time period died of tuberculosis, which is usually a lung disease, but in meningitis, it goes to the brain, which could explain his ranting and his just complete lack of coherence in those final days. And this was really fascinating to me because like, so then why was he found in other people's clothing? Mm. That's bizarre. Like Poe was known to dress in black and here he was in these clothes that didn't fit him or anything like that. And there was a thing in the 19th century called cooping. I'm just going to read this, okay? Political gangs were known to kidnap innocent travelers, bystanders, and passers-by, plying them with alcohol or drugs, then dragging them to polling station after polling station to repeatedly vote for a chosen candidate. Between excursions, as repeat voters... These unfortunate individuals were held captive in tiny rooms referred to as pens or coops, and thus the practice became known as cooping. And they would also put the people in different clothing so they would look like different people. That is so fascinating to me that Poe could have been a victim of that because it's also documented that he was very susceptible to small amounts of alcohol that caused a big reaction in him. So if they're applying him with tons of alcohol and possibly drugs, that could have really done a number on his constitution. And was there an election? Yeah, there was something going on. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that is one of the theories. You know, he talks about some of the major scandals in Poe's life, but again, he doesn't go into great detail because the focus is on his death. One of the threads throughout the biography, too, is that 
Poe is known now mainly for his gothic stories and poems, but that he has so much other writing as well that more scholars wish more people would read. Like some of his criticism, he was known as an editor and a critic. Some of his critical essays were really more modern than what was going on in the 19th century at that time period, you know, early to to mid 19th century. I really enjoyed this so much. You know, there's Philadelphia doesn't get a lot of literary love sometimes, but it was such a big literary center and Poe lived there for a while. And one of the theories is, is that it really impacted his Gothic writing to make it less in the European vein, which was more external, you know, run down castles and ghosts and stuff, and more of an internal situation where like, you know, the badness is coming from inside, it's psychological and everything. And I guess Philadelphia had a little bit of a tradition with that from the writer Charles Brockton Brown, who was an earlier American writer. So, you know, there's some of that literary history as well as some of the scandals that Poe had, but really it's tightly focused on his death. It was really interesting to hear some of the theories. One of the writers that he interviewed and that gets quoted a lot is Matthew Pearl, who wrote some really fabulous 19th century historical fiction featuring literary characters. Like the Dante Club was his first one. I really enjoy Matthew Pearl's novels, so it was cool to see him pop up in this book. So again, that was A Mystery of Mysteries, The Death and Life of Edgar Allan Poe by Mark Dowadziak, and that is out now. All right, now you'll have to check in with our mystery man and see if he's gotten to it. You guys could have a little Poe chat. (laughs) Poe chat. (laughs) This episode is sponsored by our buddy James Ben. And this is for his book, Free Gift, which is available now. Laced with history and action, Free Gift is the story of a young man born enslaved. Emancipated during the American Revolution, Free Gift must fulfill a promise made to his dying mother to seek his father, Benedict Arnold, the most hated man in America. Free Gift thrives in New London, Connecticut, alive with privateers and cutthroats until Arnold leads a force to destroy it. Free Gift finally comes face to face with his father amidst fire, death, and destruction. So there's a great book trailer for Free Gift as well, and we'll put a link to that in the show notes. That's fascinating. Some really fascinating Connecticut and obviously national history there. Yeah, and James Ben is the author of the Billy Boyle World War II mystery series. He's really great with history. Yeah. So I bet this book is fantastic. Again, that's called Free Gift, and it's available now. Did you go on any Biblio adventures? You know, I did. I had a wonderful day in New Haven last week where I went to the Institute Library, which is a subscription library. It's one of the last in America I've mentioned it before in the podcast, but it's been a while. Um, It was established in 1826, and it's been in the same location since 1878. So it's a fabulous, fabulous place to go if you're in the area. I highly recommend it. I went there looking for a first edition of Madge Jennison's memoir of owning the bookstore, The Sunwise Turn. I was like 90% sure they'd have one on the shelves, and they did. So that was really fun because I had read a PDF copy, but I wanted to see the real thing. So that was fun. And then I took myself over to Atticus Bookstore and Cafe and had lunch. I had a mushroom Reuben. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, all this talk that you've done in recent episodes about mushrooms have given me mushroom brain. <laughs> so this, there. <laughs> this mushroom Reuben, it had, instead of sauerkraut, it had red cabbage oh, and yum. mushrooms on bread with a lovely sauce. It was delish. And they bake their own bread at Atticus. It's delicious. Oh, so tasty. Yeah, yeah. Nice. And then I went over to the Sterling Memorial Library at Yale and, and worked there for a couple hours before heading home. So it was a nice day in New Haven. Lovely. I had a great Biblio adventure at RJ Julia in Madison with the author Anne Napolitano and her book, Hello Beautiful, which is probably going to be on my top 10 this year. And she was in conversation with Soon Wiley, whose novel is When We Fell Apart. 
It was a great conversation. He asked really good questions. And it was sweet because they are both graduates of Connecticut College. They went at different times, but they had the same writing teacher and she was there in the audience. Oh, how cool is that? Yeah, that was really sweet. It was sold out. They capped it out. We've been to events like this at RJ, like they put the chairs together in a way that you kind of look at them like this is impossible. So it wasn't the most comfortable event. My knees were up at my chin, but the conversation was great. Anne talked about how it is semi autobiographical in the sense that when she was growing up, not in Chicago, she had an uncle in Chicago who would write her letters and they would, they started with hello, beautiful. Mm -hmm. And he would just write her letters. And so Chicago always seemed like this magical place to her. And they would go visit every once in a while. And that's why she chose to place this book in we got laughed at last time because I think we called it Pilsner Park, but it's or Pilsner. We called it Pilsner because we had beer on the brain apparently. Yeah, (laughs) Pilsen. Pilsen neighborhood. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's where the book takes place. So I just wanted to say that she talked about that. She also talked about during the time that she was writing this, it was COVID and her father was dying. And because it was COVID, she couldn't be with him as happened to a lot of people. And so she really felt like she needed to get into this novel and just kind of get lost in another world because the world she was living in was so hard. Someone asked her a question, do you write for yourself or for the reader? And we've heard a lot of authors be asked this question and her answer was much different. She said, I write for the characters. How cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And she said, I'm most concerned about my characters and writing beautiful sentences. Which she does. Yeah. I love that. (laughs) Yeah. I read four characters. Characters are what do it for me and Mm -hmm. setting and everything. Yeah. And this is one of those books which it was just nominated or picked, I guess not nominated. It was just picked as Oprah's 100th book club book. So it's gotten a lot of extra attention. I mean, not that Oprah's book club picks don't get plenty of attention, but being that it's the 100th, there's been a lot of pomp and circumstance around it. So she also told the story of getting the call from Oprah, which was the very last question of the evening. And she said, I can't believe it's taken this long for somebody to ask that question. And she said, I was taking the garbage out and going to fill the meter for my car on the street. And the phone rang and it was a Chicago number. So she said, I had given my uncle a copy of the book, like sent it a couple of weeks ahead of time. She said, we're an Irish Catholic family, so we really don't talk about anything. So I didn't really think it was him calling to tell me what he thought of the book. But I answered the phone and someone said, hi, Anne, it's Oprah Winfrey. And she said, I thought it was like those calls you get from Bill Clinton saying, you know, please vote for so and so. (laughs) So she was like, the Oprah Winfrey, like Oprah, Oprah Winfrey. And she said, yes. And then proceeded to tell her that she was choosing her book for her hundredth book club pick, but this was like five months ago. Wow. So she said, then you're sworn to secrecy, Uh like serious, like signing NDAs and all sorts of things. And apparently she said, Oprah has pulled books from people. Yep. Yep. She does not mess around about that. Yeah. She doesn't play as they say. So that was fun. It was a really fun evening. I mean, the questions were great One of the other little things, little tidbits she dropped about herself is that when she was in her 20s, she was Sting's personal assistant. Really? That's cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And the reason she talked about that is because she was recently with Gail King and Oprah when they did this big announcement on, I think it's CBS This Morning is what Gail King is a part of. She's like, Gail King is the nicest person I've ever met. And that's when she said, you know, I was Sting's personal assistant and I met a lot of famous people. I can't say that about all famous people, (laughs) but she's like, Gail King is amazing. She had my book, you know, post-its everywhere, was talking to me about it. You know, it was Oprah that was really there to talk about the book. So I have a feeling Gail reads what Oprah tells her to read. (laughs) So it was a great evening and I just can't speak highly enough about this book and you will miss the characters. When she said that about she writes for her characters, I was like, this is why it's one of those books 
you finish and you think about them and miss them desperately. Mm. Wow. See, you know, sometimes when you talk about books, I think like, okay, good. I, I, I know about the book now. Like, I'm definitely gonna have to read this one, it sounds like. If you like character driven stories about in this case, in particular, it's this group of sisters who are based on a group of sisters that were the mother of one of her best friends growing up. It was her mother's sisters. So it was this best friend and all of her aunts. And she said they would just constantly be coming in and out of the house. They all had a very similar face, like it was different versions of the same face is how she described it. But she said they always seemed like better versions of themselves when they were all together. Hmm, wow. Wow. And so this is about this group of sisters. It's definitely an homage to Little Women, which she said she didn't realize she was writing until people started pointing <laughs> that out. There's a nod to Little Women in that at one point, there's a scene where all the sisters are saying which sister they would be in Little Women. But she didn't really think like, oh, I'm writing an homage to Little Women, but yeah. she kind of is. And then there's this character, this man that comes into the lives of these sisters. And there's a whole arc about basketball too and Anne was like I've never played basketball but for some reason I just became enamored and started reading all of these historical books and biographies about basketball and so she knew that part of this novel had to have basketball in it so interesting. so interesting you know yeah. I listened to an interview with a writer gosh I'm sorry I can't remember his name but it was on the podcast drafting the past which I love and Full disclosure, I'm a Patreon supporter of, but he talked about how one thing historians would benefit from is reading sports writing mm. because it's so engaging when it's well done. And the guy's like not really an athlete or anything, but he just said it's so vivid mm. and full of movement and, and things like that. Yeah. What's that book? Boys in the Boat. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, I'd, I'd audioed yeah. that one. Yeah, me yeah. too. And that's got those scenes. The rowing scenes were just like I was on the edge of my seats, you know, as listening to that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. So I could see like when when you said that, I could see like I I guess having listened to that and hearing her getting hooked on it, I could see how that could happen. Yeah, that's good writing, right? Yep. And she does a year's worth of research, and then starts writing the book. So she was reading all these basketball things, you know? Yeah. So again, that was Anne Napolitano in conversation with soon Wiley, whose book when we fell apart, I want to read because I mean, he was just so compelling. And his questions were fantastic. It was a great conversation. Sorry, I missed that one. Yeah, me hmm. too. So I had two biblio audio adventures that were really great through the podcast bio, which is the podcast of biographers international organization. So there are two recent episodes. One was with Hillary A. Hallett, and her book is The Hollywood It Girl, How Eleanor Glenn Created the Modern Romance and Conquered Early Hollywood. Sounds fantastic. And then the other episode was with author Diana P. Parcell. Her book is Eliza Skidmore, The Trailblazing Journalist Behind Washington's Cherry Trees. And that was another fascinating sounding book. Skidmore, her dates were 1856 to 1928. And Diana talked about reading this travel memoir. And she was like, wow, who is this guy? Like, you know, it's the 19th century and he's like everywhere and like just fascinated. And so she looked up the author and that guy turned out to be a woman, Eliza Skidmore, who had traveled to Alaska, Japan, Java, China, and India and wrote wonderfully about it. She was a journalist. And so she was in the Washington Monument when it was being built, right? She's up there on this big elevator that took people up as high as it could go at that point. And she's looking out over what would become the mall where the cherry trees are. And she said, like, this is going to be the most magnificent garden in the city. And so, you know, lo and behold, then decades later, here are cherry trees attributed to her, which is really kind of a fascinating thing. And so I just also wanted to give a shout out to that podcast, because it's always talking about books, as is drafting the past. And I think sometimes book people might miss podcasts like that, when they're looking for bookish podcasts. So I just wanted to give them a shout out. And those will be in the show notes. So you can find them. So upcoming, John's, what's on your calendar? I have a 
date with my book cougar buddy to go to Simmons Library next week. <laughs> We've been trying to make this happen since you started library school, oh my gosh. I think. Well, almost, because the library just opened. They just had this huge renovation. Well, it didn't just open. Last semester it opened. But yeah, we've been trying to plan a Simmons Day Mm -hmm. and it hasn't happened, but now it is. Yes. So that'll be fun. And I'm going to try to drag Chris to one of the flower bakeries. She's got them all over the city, so we should be able to find one. Flower bakery. Yeah. Drag me. Okay. Yeah. I will. (laughs) I've always told Emily, wherever she wants to take me for food, just I'm there. Right on. Because you always have such great picks. Well, I'm going to be going to New York one day next week to have lunch with a friend that I've never met in person. It's a friend from a writer's group I've been in for over two years now. We meet monthly. So she's going to be in New York City cat sitting. And we're finally going to get together. And I'm hoping to go to the new McNally Jackson store at Rockefeller Center which just opened not too long ago, and it's supposedly their largest store. Oh, I'm going to have green eyed envy. I cannot wait to hear about that. Yeah, so I'll definitely report back about that. Right on. Do you have any upcoming reads? I do. Colleen, our listener who does her annual birthday buddy read, has chosen Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom. I'm going to be reading that too. We have very different copies. If any of you have not had a chance to jump over to our YouTube channel, we did a video where we showed the copies that we each have of that book. Mine harkens back to my childhood. Yes. (laughs) And mine is the most recent non-movie cover. And we have a conversation about that. So I'm really looking forward to diving into this book to see how it holds up. Yeah, after me too. All these decades. Yeah, I think it will. We'll see. I'm sure. Although I read a review recently that did talk about a few things, like maybe there are diet pills and things like that. Mm. I can't remember. Interesting. What was in the review. So. Well, one of the things when I was talking with Laura, my wife, about the cover and saying like I didn't like the cover at first, but now I do because it shows text bubbles. Mm-hmm. For those of you who haven't seen it, Google it and you can see that the new cover has text bubbles with her saying, "Are you there, God?" Another bubble. It's me, Margaret. And then on the left hand side, there's a response started, you know, the dot, dot, dot thing. And I was saying how cool this is and inviting to younger generations. And Laura was like, I don't know. She's like, you know, it could be kind of misleading. And I was like, you think, you know, and so Laura had been holding the book and she flipped it open and to the page she flipped it open to. It's talking about learning cursive handwriting in third grade. (laughs) So I was like, okay, maybe it might be a little misleading for younger generations then. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting. We'll see. Yeah. The technology is definitely different. Yeah. For sure. But you yeah. know what? It's going to be a bunch of middle aged women enjoying very visiting a childhood favorite. So right. you can't go wrong with that. Exactly. I have a big thank you to our listener, Barb, who sent us a glowing email stroking our egos. Thank you, Barb. <laughs> we'll take those any day. <laughs> but, but she also recommended to me particularly a book called Properties of Thirst by Marianne Wiggins. And she said she thinks I'll really enjoy the food. There's mm. a lot of French food in this book. Oh, yeah. So a copy of the book is on its way. So I'll be sharing that hopefully on the next episode. I don't think I'll have it read by the next episode. It's quite large. I think it's like 600 pages, but hopefully I will have started it by then. Very cool. Well, the other one on both of our list for next month is Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck for the Vintage Book Club, which meets April 20th in South Windsor, Connecticut. If anybody is local and would like to join us, we'd love to have you. It's a book club that's sponsored by Book Club on the Go and the Wood Memorial Library Museum. So more to come on that. I'm sure we'll talk about it again like we did with The Winter of Our Discontent and and some of the other earlier Steinbeck we read together. And this will be our last Steinbeck. It is, yes. With the book group, little history, we started as the Willa Cather Book Club, but then after we read all 12 of her novels, everybody wanted to stay together, but we didn't want to pick a new book every quarter because, you know, that takes a lot of time sometimes And we also like the idea of studying an author a little bit, but maybe not their complete list. So we decided we do four novels. So a year, 12 months of reading a particular author and Steinbeck was voted as our first one. And then we recently voted on who our next author will be. And we're going with the homegirl. Yeah, Anne Petrie. 
really looking forward to it. And when I was at RJ the other night, they had a beautiful display because they've put them all out in these new covers. Yes. Right? Yeah. I'm really curious about those covers because like the Narrows, which was, I think, her second novel, the cover that I have has a woman on the cover. And the new edition has a man on the cover. Mm. So I'm like, so what does that mean mm. in terms of cover design and the story? They're really great, though, those new covers. Yeah. They're, they pop yeah. wonderfully. They're beautiful. Yeah. I could, we could post a picture of that picture I took, although it doesn't really show the covers. I guess it shows the spines. Yeah. So maybe in the future we'll get a nice picture of all of those. Totally. But yeah, so Ann Petrie is born in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, which is just a couple towns over from where we are. And she did live in New York City in Harlem for several years. And then after she hit it big with The Street, her novel, which is the first novel by an African-American woman to sell a million or more copies she and her husband moved back to Old Saybrook, where she lived for the rest of her life. And, you know, many of her stories are about living as a person of color in a small town in primarily white Connecticut. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We have a great video on our YouTube channel of us standing outside of her home yes. in Old Saybrook. So get to that YouTube channel. Subscribe. <laughs> Subscribe to that. Yeah. And, and we'll put a link to in uh, the show notes with that video. Yeah, that's, that's a fun. great idea. Make it easy. All right. Coming up next is our author spotlight with author Jennifer Saverin Kelly. Yes, she's the author of End Papers, which just came out last month. Fabulous story. It is about a queer Jewish bookbinder, book artist, a novel of discovery, self-discovery, historical discovery, creative discovery and expression. I mean, this novel, it's going to be in my top 10 this year. There's just no way it can't be. I love this novel so much and I want everyone to read it. Yes. I don't have anything to add. I loved it too. <laughs> I mean, I really thought, you know, like Chris had read the novel already. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to give it a quick skim before we talk with Jen. And I gave two days over to it. I just loved it. And there's a lot of art in it. It's very New York City. Yes. It's a fantastic debut novel. And we hope you enjoy our conversation with Jen. We are thrilled to be here with Jennifer Saverin Kelly, author of End Papers, a fabulous debut novel about a genderqueer bookbinder in post-9-11 New York City. End Papers explores the struggles of identity, creative expression, and relationships in a society that claims to support independence but actually rebukes individuality. End Papers is Jen's debut novel. She's also published short fiction, nonfiction, and has co-written a feature-length film. Jen is a production editor, bookbinder, and book artist, and we cannot wait to talk with her about all of the above. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you for all that you do for books and authors. It's an important time for um, supporting, especially with all the book banning going on. So. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we <laughs> love books and we love diversity. We, we think we can't have enough of that in our world. Yeah. yeah. So... Jen, we wanted to start just by defining some terms for listeners. And so the term genderqueer, can you talk a little bit about what that means to you? Yeah, because like the character in my novel, Dawn, I grew up in a time before these words were in the mainstream, non-binary and genderqueer and people using they, them pronouns. And so for myself, even though I now identify as genderqueer, it took me quite a while to figure out what these terms meant and what was the right word that I felt like I should use. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of overlap. There's, you know, gender fluid, gender queer, non-binary, and some people use them interchangeably. Some people are very specific about them not being the same. And so for me, I, what gender queer means to me and why I think we ultimately chose it for how to describe my main character, Dawn, is when you do identify with the gender you were assigned at birth, but there's an expansive idea of what that means. So for example, I don't see myself as a woman in the typical sense, right? So there are things about me that I identify as being more masculine. And so I just don't feel like I fit very neatly into the category of woman or female. And so for me, I will describe myself as gender queer. There are times when I feel like I fit more into 
masculinity and there are times when I don't, but I do know that it's never totally straightforwardly female or woman. So that to me is where the term gender queer comes from. But I would guess that if you asked, if you had 10 gender queer people standing in a room and you asked each of them to define the term, they would probably define it a little bit differently. So yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Because I think it is so important to know where people are coming from. And hence why it's important to ask people like, what are your pronouns? Or what do you mean when you say that word? Because I know some people are more comfortable, like I say lesbian, that's how I identify queer sometimes but you know it just really depends so much on context yeah yeah yeah. i understand that too because i also identify as bisexual although that's sort of changed in recent years as i've understood the term pansexual and i don't know anymore so right (laughs) Right? (laughs) exactly and and fluid and all of that i mean i am so with you on that i don't really know what i am but i still i guess identify as lesbian politically anyway tmi Well, I mean, I also think it's just interesting to look at age and time period. You know, when I was growing up in a very liberal town, to use the word queer would have been incredibly offensive. Yes, exactly. You know, so now it's being embraced and I have to really work at that because it feels not that I object to the term and how it's being used, but it doesn't roll easily off the tongue for me because of perceptions growing up around that word. Yes, Yes. Same. Words have changed so much in the last couple of decades. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about end papers. Can you tell the listeners what this book is about? Yeah, this book is at its heart. It's a sort of literary mystery, I guess. It's a search for, I'll start with my main character, Dawn, who we said identifies as genderqueer, is a bookbinder and a book artist. And in the process of repairing a book at work comes across a letter under the end papers of that book. And for listeners who may not know, the end papers are those leaves at the beginning and end that are affixed to the inside covers. And then also there's usually a loose one. And so Dawn finds a letter underneath the end papers of a book that she's repairing. And it's on the back of the cover of a pulp novel from the 1950s. And it's a queer pulp novel, which you can tell by the illustration. And then on the back is a love letter written in German. And Dawn doesn't speak German, but recognizes the word love in German. And so becomes a little bit obsessed with finding out who wrote it because it's from a woman to another woman. And the illustration on the cover of the book makes it seem as though the person might have been transgender. So my main character becomes kind of obsessed because she doesn't really know how to identify or understand herself, how to figure out what she is, what how, how to identify. And so she feels like this letter might help her get some answers if she can find the person who wrote it and find out what happened to them, what kind of life they had. And so that's sort of the inciting incident of the book and that that's what the mystery becomes. We're going to go off <laughs> off task right away. So Jen is a book binder. So have you yeah. ever uncovered something in end papers in your work? I have not. No, I've, I've always wished that I would. But in my very first bookbinding workshop, our instructor talked to us about this phenomenon that there have been binders who have found personal letters hidden under the end papers of books. So for many, many years, I sort of walked around with this notion in my mind and this very romantic idea that, you know, maybe someday I'd find one or someone might have even left one for me. <laughs> <laughs> so instead, you had to write a novel about it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Perfect. You know, that's so cool because um, we recently talked with author Amy Tector, who has a, a series called the Dominion Archive series. And the first book in that series deals with an archivist who finds personal letters tucked inside the binding of a book. Oh, wow. So that kind of sparks off her mystery. So it is really fascinating to think about what you can find. There's going to be this whole movement of people like, you know, taking, you know, sh- <laughs> knives and like, oh, I just I feel a little bump in here. I want to I want to dig deeper. Yes. Oh, no. That's all not destroy books, but we can imagine it. because. It's right. really- <laughs> <laughs> well, I loved so much about this book. I mean, I really it was so compulsively readable for me. You know, that term unput downable. I know some people don't like that term, but that's the experience for me. I mean, I I loved her exploration of herself and her struggle to try and figure out who she was within, you know, the world and then the different groups that she's a part of. 
one of the things you bring to light that I don't think a lot of people realize is that even like within the queer or LGBTQ community, whatever, however you want to define that, you know, there are pressures to be a certain way within those subcultures as well, that you're not acting femme enough or butch enough with whatever identity you first came into that group. And I found that to be so subtly done and very refreshing and something I could identify with and something I want other people to understand about being in the world. Because sometimes I wonder if folks don't even understand the pressures that they have within the different groups that they're in. And that's not exactly a question, is it? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I guess I just want to say thank you so much for writing this book about the struggle with gender, sexuality, but then also the joys of books and book binding and being a book artist. I would just like to read a few lines from one section of the book. I'm currently in a course called The History of the Book, and the professor is a printer herself and had us hand make some books, including... Well, I don't want to give any spoilers, but I'm just want to read this section. So this is Dawn. She says, at the workbench, I take out a large sheet in my bone folder. My breath calms as I begin to fold it into a signature, the tool molding into the palm of my hand while I reshape the empty expanse into a less intimidating size. When I finish, I run my fingers over the grainy surface, count the leaves and confirm eight. I'm just wondering if you can explain that to readers who may not understand exactly what the character is doing in that scene. Yes. And by the way, thank you so much. That was for all of your kind words. So what's happening in that scene is one of the first things I actually learned how to do when I took a bookbinding workshop, which is to start with a very large sheet of paper and a tool called a bone folder, which is essentially a small piece of bone that's been molded into the shape of a it's sort of flat and long, the size of maybe a pencil, like a long pencil, and it has a tip on it. And they also make them out of things that are not bone nowadays. They're so-called bone folders. And um, what you do is you take that large sheet of paper and your bone folder, and you start folding it. You fold it once, and then you, you, know, you smooth the crease with the bone folder, fold it again and again until you have a folded sheet that's roughly the size of a book. And the bigger sheet becomes many sheets. And so you're actually slitting the paper with the bone folder as you're folding as well, so that you're separating the one sheet into several. And so you end up with a signature. It's called a signature once it's printed. It's actually called a signature, but that's essentially how you end up with a signature for a book or a folded group of, of papers. You start with a larger sheet. Awesome. That scene made me so excited to read. I have to say, I totally <laughs> geeked out about it. So I want to talk about Dawn's Jewish identity yeah. And Gertrude's Jewish identity as well. So Gertrude is a character that comes in based on this little book or letter, really, that Dawn finds in the end papers of a book as she's working her book binding job at the Met. Part of the mystery is for Dawn to find this woman, Gertrude. And I want to talk about the layers of identity that you built in the book, because we have Gertrude who fled Nazi Germany because of her Jewish identity, and then comes to the States and is hiding because of her sexual orientation. And then we have Dawn, who's now in post 9-11, 2003, New York City, who's kind of struggling with her Jewish identity and her orientation as well. Can you talk about those two characters and building that story arc? Yeah. So I'm also Jewish and queer. And I think that when Gosh, I hate that I need to talk about this, but when Trump was elected, it was a few years before that, that I had come up with the idea to write this book. And I wasn't quite sure that as a novelist, if I tackled issues like queer identity and religion, I guess I was afraid that it would turn into more of a treatise or a very long essay than a novel. And so I felt a little intimidated by the idea of approaching a novel. But then Trump got elected and I saw a lot of things happening. I saw a lot of people getting scared and I saw that I had been very much in the closet. I married a heterosexual cisgender man with a somewhat conservative family. And I just thought that the queer community would not accept me saying anything other than that I was straight mm -hmm. <laughs> at that point. And I thought that 
straight, the straight community wouldn't accept anything other than that I was straight. So I just let everything go. And then when Trump was elected, I just felt like there must be other people like me. There must be so many people that have family members who are queer or Jewish or just whatever it is that don't broadcast it for whatever reason. And that people don't understand that it's not just like someone over there on the news that's being impacted, but but people in their lives who they love or, or care about. And so I just felt a really big obligation to speak out. And um, it was the first time as a Jewish person growing up in the United States that I felt scared. And it was new. You know, we had learned about the Holocaust growing up and we, we would have people come to temple to talk about it, survivors. And so it was very real, but it was never anything that I thought. I never felt that I was personally in any danger in this country. And so again, after Trump got elected, that changed. And so as I approached the novel, all of these things just became very important to me to speak up about. I didn't know if anyone would read it. You know, I had not published a novel before, but I that was my way that I felt like I could try to make some contribution at the time. So I challenged myself to try to make a real story out of this and not just have it be, you know, an essay. And so what I did was I researched personal stories rather than researching the Holocaust in particular. I went to the library. I made it a point to find, you know, personal stories from the Holocaust so that I could get a sense of what people were going through, what kinds of things they were experiencing. And then similarly with, with queer folks, I did a lot of research on the Lavender Scare and queer pulp fiction and, and really tried to find anywhere that I could find personal stories that could inspire me to come up with my own so that I could mix those things, but also make sure that there was a social justice message in there. That was my process. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's fabulous the way you wove everything together and in such a way that that was a story. It is a story. I never felt like you were wagging your finger yeah. as some other books I've read in the past have. The pulp lesbian fiction phenomena that was, you know, I know a lot of people look back at that and they think, oh, how terrible and objectifying women and the lesbians always had to die or end up in prison at the end. But, you know, and I, I hate to give too many spoilers, but I do want to say like it, some of these things helped other people find one another and build a sense of community out of what was, you know, perceived as negative or at least on the CD side. Yeah, that was what I learned when I was doing my research and what excited me so much because I always didn't ignore queer pulp or dismiss it, but I did feel that this wasn't something I would ever want to read. And when I started doing the research and realizing the overlap with the Lavender Scare and, you know, seeing what you're talking about now, that sort of the light went on, you know, and I thought there's something more here that I want to explore. Yeah. 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 Well, talk about lights going on. My light went on when Emily and I were talking just before we started recording about the character's name, John, being. <laughs> like Jen's just shaking her head. <laughs> like, <yes. laughs> it also, well, an interesting thing about that is I was talking to my sister on the phone and she said, you know, is Dawn a Jewish name? Because it doesn't seem like a Jewish name to me. And I said, you know, I should double check that. I said, I think it is, but let me double check. And when I looked it up, what I saw was that in Hebrew, Shahar, which is Dawn, is both a male and a female name. Oh, oh very good. Wow. And so that added on to my excitement about the name. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the other things Chris said when she walked into Book Cougar's headquarters today was that she doesn't think she's ever read a novel where someone walked into a synagogue. How did you say it? Well, somebody that somebody walked into a, a, a temple for comfort. You know, I've read tons of books where there, you know, somebody goes into a church or a cathedral. Like I just read The Warden and there's a scene where a character goes into a cathedral. But this is the first time I recall someone going into a temple for comfort and finding comfort. So can you talk about the story of Abraham and Lot and the rabbi's sermon that you talk about in your acknowledgments that inspired you to refer to that story in the novel? Yeah. And this is actually a funny story that I don't think I've told publicly yet, but there was one night when I was working on the book, I was feeling very stuck and my son had something going on through Hebrew school at the temple and we had to bring him. And the winter in upstate New York is very cold. 
very gray, very snowy, and the temple's about 20 minutes away, so I, I kind of didn't want to go, but of course we went, and as I sat there and I listened to everything that was going on, it was very quiet, and I started flipping through the sea door or the prayer book, and I found that meditation that Dawn finds that leads her to ask about that sermon, and there was something about the meditation as I looked at it, and I had been stuck on the book, and I said, oh my gosh, this feels like the sort of central struggle that my main character is having in my book. I thought a lot about it and I went home and I Googled it and I found a sermon about this meditation and the, the rabbi was talking about Abraham and Lot. And so in the meditation, the main question essentially is we're standing, I'm gonna butcher it a little bit, but we're standing at an hour of change. Shall we draw back my brother, my sister, or shall we cross over? Or we stand certain, uncertain, at the border of change or something like that. Shall we draw back? Shall we cross over? And so um, the story of Abraham and Lot, which, oh my gosh, I hope I remember well enough, is that God was testing Abraham, essentially, because Abraham was a very strong believer and would do whatever God said, but God wanted to strike down the city of Sodom because there were too many sinners there. And Abraham who usually went along without questioning, said, well, you know, shall not a God who wants justice deal justly, right? So why would you strike down the city if there are people there who are not sinners? Lot was in the city and wouldn't leave and was refusing to leave. But it was a visitor who then came and said, you know, took Lot by the hand and said, you should go. And Lot really didn't leave because he didn't want to let go of all of his possessions. I think that's, I think I'm remembering this mm -hmm. correctly. So the idea of the question is, you know, do we be like Abraham? Do we be like Lot? Or are we the visitor? And this rabbi, you know, suggests that we can, there's a little of somebody in everyone. You know, we all know what it's like to to want to do the right thing. And, you know, we all know what it's like to want to hold on to what we have, even if it's the wrong thing. And we all know what it's like to be able to take someone by the hand and say, hey, you know, you need to make this change. Let's go. So again, I feel like I'm, I'm butchering the story a little bit, but that idea of when you're asking that question, if you're faced with an hour of change or the difficult decision, shall we draw back, you know, or shall we cross over and how that you can you can think about these three figures and think about, you know, how much of each one are you or do you want to be? And that becomes Dawn's question throughout the book. So again, I really hope I didn't butcher that. Yeah, no, <laughs> you did a great job. Um, I was going to read the meditation for you if you wanted, but I think you did a great job with that. I mean, and not only does it become Dawn's something she's struggling with, but it's in, in all man, it manifests itself in all aspects of her life, you know, with her friendships, with her art, with her sexuality. So what a miracle for you to, you know, force yourself to take your son you know, to, to Hebrew school and then, you know, have an aha moment for your novel. <laughs> I know, right? I, it's, we often like, writers often think that if we can just stay and toil away, the, the ideas will come, but often we need to step away and live life and let the ideas come to us. Mm, yeah. Good reminder. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, speaking of being a writer, can you tell us a little bit about how you became a writer? Yeah, I, you know, I had always written, I just never had thought of myself as a writer, funny enough, you know, I just wrote in my journal, or I wrote letters, and I read, I was a reader. And I studied English literature in college. And then it was really as a bookbinder. I found bookbinding after college when I moved to New York City. And um, I wanted to make my own books, but I wasn't a writer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had dabbled in visual art. So I would they would be very heavily illustrated. And I would just sort of do a little bit of what Dawn does in the beginning of the book. I'd go around and I'd eavesdrop and I'd take little bits of conversations. And I, I used to say, it's not prose and it's not poetry. It's just words. So I would just find words to put in my books. And then I had a friend who convinced me to write a, a screenplay with him and he was a filmmaker. So he actually produced it. We produced it all on our own. And that was really fun. And that gave me a lot more confidence as a writer. And then when my son was born, I just didn't have time either to work in my bindery because if he slept for 20 minutes during the day, it could take me 20 minutes just to set up to work and then another 20 minutes just to clean up when I'm done. So that was out. I couldn't go work in my bindery unless I had him in, you know, like in his little carrier. And then I was really just up to like how long he would let me work. 
I couldn't really collaborate with anyone on a film anymore because I just couldn't promise that I had time or commit to any certain time. So um, the thing I could do was write. If I had 20 minutes, I could write. So I said, finally, okay, it's just me and my words and nothing else. And I'm going to give this a go. And that was, he's 15 now. So (laughs) that's great. Well, thanks to your son for for this novel, I guess, right? In a roundabout way. (laughs) He keeps pushing me, whether it's to the temple. (laughs) That's right. I don't know if this is a spoiler, but I'm going to ask the question. So Dawn is an artist herself. You know, she's a bookbinder in her day job, but she's an artist as well. And she ends up getting an invitation to create an art installation. And what I'm wondering is, I'm wondering two things. There's a lot of street art that inspires Dawn. And she goes out just like you ended up in Temple. She ends up out on the streets, walking the streets, taking pictures. Was there street art that inspired you? And I'm going to ask two parts to this question. Did you make a mock-up of the project in the book? Oh gosh, I'm going to answer the second question first because I so badly wanted to, <laughs> and I still do, but the writing of the book and I work full time and I, and I have my son. So the time it would have taken to find artists to collaborate with and make all of this stuff, like I just, I never could, but I would love to, that's kind of a dream of mine. Maybe you could call this street art. Um, Jenny Holzer was a huge influence on me. Um, because I loved writing and I loved reading when I had to take an art history class and I learned about Jenny Holzer and I, it was the first time I was, I was exposed to a visual artist that uses words as her medium and a visual artist that uses the street. I mean, that uses public places to exhibit her art. And so you could just come across Jenny Holzer's work. And so that made me start looking more closely at street art, more properly considered street art. And so yeah, I just became really fascinated with the idea of public art. And I think for the same reason that books draw me in so much, which is that they're one of the only art forms that you actually physically interact with so intimately. So they have this place of, you know, we consider literature to be sort of a high form of art, but it's also something that you you might dog ear your pages and throw it into your backpack. And, you know, there's something very personal about it. You know, you carry it around with you, you bring it into bed with you, just like street art, you might just be walking around and suddenly it's just there, you know, and you can touch it. You can, you can do what you want. Nobody's going to stop you. Um, you can even put more art on it if you yes. want. <laughs> People do. So it's, it's a kind of interactive, collaborative thing, much like reading. And so I think it just felt like a sort of natural marriage in a way for yeah. the book. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I was hoping you'd say, yeah, right behind me is, no, I'm <laughs> no. just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I did do a tour of street art of the Lower East Side while I was writing the book because there were some pieces that I'd only seen like in books or online. And so I was really excited to see some of them like close. And Well, can you also talk a little bit about your work as a production editor? I think a lot of our listeners are familiar with an editor as somebody who goes through and helps shape somebody's writing or, you know, does copy editing on it. What does a production editor do? Yeah. So once, once an acquisitions editor acquires a book for, so I work at Cornell University Press. And so once a project has been worked on with the acquisitions editor and it's ready, they're saying, okay, it's ready. We want to publish this now, essentially, you know, it's, it's been through the editorial process with the acquisitions editor then it transmits to production. And as the production editor, I take it over and then I manage it from that point through copy editing to the page proof stage where it gets typeset and starts to look like it will as a book through the proofreading stage and then through to printing and binding and proofreading all of the cover copy and then making sure when the book gets published that it looks the way it's supposed to. So even though I'm working with a lot of freelancers, I'm not actually doing a lot of that work myself. So I am I have copy editing experience, so I can oversee the work of the copy editors. So I'll send it out for copy editing, review copy editing, prepare it for typesetting or composition, and then review the page proofs while the authors are reviewing them. And then, yeah, move it along until it's a bound book. Wow. So how many books are you juggling at a time, like in all these different phases of production? About, I would say roughly 25 books a year that's a lot wow that's a lot and do you read them more than once um should i say this on the air we don't read (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I mean, we we familiarize ourselves yeah. with them. Yeah. Sure. The copy editors read them. Yeah. And if we hire a proofreader, mm -hmm. then the proofreader will read them all the way through. But we're usually reading parts, like mm -hmm. just the parts that we are checking the work of. And so we're reading sample, sample parts of the book. Yeah, that makes oh, sense. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. 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 Wow. Oh, I know what I wanted to ask you about. This is kind of funny, but <laughs> <laughs> I want to know about the bread that Gertrude fed Don that's referred to as tit bread. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had a professor as an undergrad and she invited me to her house and she was extremely, extremely intimidating. She was an English professor. I had no idea why she invited me to her house. I was in her lecture class of like, I don't know, a thousand students. And something made her say, why don't you come over? I want to talk to you. She was, I didn't know she was going to invite me to be her TA for the next semester, but she pulled out this loaf of bread and it was two square loaves that were joined and they had these swirls at the top. And she had, she brought it out. She goes, would you like a slice? I call this tit bread. <laughs> And here was this woman that I was just so intimidated by, and she's holding this <laughs> bread in front of me, and she says, do you want a piece of tit bread? <laughs> and it just relaxed me completely. <laughs> and so I knew it had to go in the book. Um, and so that's, that's where it came from. Oh, that's Thank a great story. Yes, yeah. for regaling us yeah. with that. That made me laugh. And then um, there was a scene where Don is in the book bindery, and Amina is like kind of preparing the materials they need to do their work. And I was reading and I thought it said Amina was whipping up wheat pasta. And I was like, why would she be making wheat pasta? And then I was like, oh, wheat paste, which then, of course, brought me back to my years when we used to make that. And then I would eat it because I thought it was delicious, but that's a whole other story. So right. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, in like when you do conservation, you don't use like flour, like you buy like a, I don't know what they would call it, but it's, it's not food grade. You wouldn't eat it. Okay. <laughs> Jen was scoffing at me. Like you <laughs> ate wheat paste. Got it. <laughs> I mean, I ate paste when I was yeah. little. <laughs> yeah. I have one more question. Did you have a question, Chris? Oh, well, I was going to ask if you could tell us a little bit about what you're working on now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to, I have, um, one book that's finished now, I'm sort of just in a in a holding pattern with it, but my son, who is now 15, has Tourette syndrome. And when he was 11, we wrote a book together. We started writing a book together and we finished it. And he reads a lot of fantasy. So it's a middle grade fantasy novel. And the protagonist is a 12 year old boy with Tourette syndrome and it's narrated in first person so that the vocal tics are actually in the narration, which we were really excited about. So that's one. So that's a kid's book. And then for adults, I'm actually wrapping up a literary murder mystery right now. That's mm -hmm. kind of more of like a family saga. And then I'm in the very early stages of, and, you know, because of our ages, you will understand this reference, but most people don't anymore. But I'm in the very early stages of a what I keep referring to as a sort of queer Handmaid's Tale meets nine to five. The movie. <laughs> Nice, nice. I can't wait. Oh my gosh. I'm very much in love with that. Book. I really just want to turn all of my attention to that one now. Um, we we so, want you to. Yes. <laughs> I need a more current reference than nine to five, though, because a lot of people who are just like even 10 years younger don't really know what that is necessarily. That's interesting because somebody did recently, they did a cover of nine to five. Yeah. I was going to say the song, you know, the song. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I wonder if maybe it's the tip of a resurgence or something. That's what I was wondering too. We just have to get Dolly on the case. <laughs> I mean, it's such a good movie. I just watched it. I just rewatched it with my son and I, from 1980 and I couldn't it's, believe how good it was. Yeah. It holds up. Yeah. 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 It really it does. Really yeah. does. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that sounds really fascinating. <laughs> well, the only other thing I wanted to talk about was just friendship in this novel. There's so many different kinds of friendship. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just wanted you to talk about that, you know, what friendship means to you and how you decided the different kind of like spokes of Dawn's life and the friends she has. That's a great question. I think I didn't want it to be just about her romantic relationships, because I also think there's something and maybe it's my own self-consciousness about the word bisexual is that 
I feel like people get this sense with queer people just because the word like homosexual, bisexual, has the word sexual in it. And I feel like there's this sense that it's all about sex and romance and relationships. And I think there's always been a part of me that wants to show that it's so much more than that. And that I didn't want to just focus on Dawn's romantic relationship, but that there are other relationships in her life that are equally important. And um, they all make up a full person, a full queer person, right? Or just a person. And so I think because I didn't want it to be a romance, but I wanted relationships to be important. And I think that especially for people who are, um, for whatever reason, shunned by their families or sort of not accepted for who they are, that they're always looking for other ways to find closeness with people, to find close relationships. And, you know, the friendship with Gertrude, of course, that's like having, you know, a way to have like a, an ancestor, a queer ancestor. And she's also very self-involved, you know, as a character. And I felt like she's not very likable most of the time. And I needed her to have people that were sort of not always reflecting back the best, being more of a true mirror for her because you can't see yourself necessarily. So to have her friends, like people that she was close to be able to reflect back, like what she was putting out so that she could change um, and that she could grow. So I think for all of those reasons, I felt like Dawn's friendships were, were really important to the story. Yeah. Yeah. I had a real aha moment when I was reading it because I felt like your friendships are also, you know, unlike your family of origin, which for Dawn is problematic your friendships are your opportunity to kind of have a restart and be the person you want to be and grow into without the weight of family lore and family history upon your shoulders. I like that. Yeah. And I I thought you just painted her relationships so beautifully and, you know, and her growth as a person, you know, hopefully we're all growing and changing all the time. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk with us. We love the novel. We're super fans at this point and can't wait for what's to come. Yes. And as your character Gertrude would say, go forth boldly. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was a true joy. And I just really appreciate all the support. Thank you. We can't wait to see what you come out with next. No pressure. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again with another episode in two weeks. Until then, come chat with us on social media, Goodreads, or email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. If you'd like to help support our podcast, please tell others about us, leave a review wherever you listen, and consider becoming a patron. Even a dollar a month is a big help. Learn more about that on our website, bookcougars.com where you'll find the show notes for this and all of our past episodes. Thanks, everybody. This episode was edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.